to the fourth class on principles of marketing. Last time you all did a really good job. I had posted your grades on passing the roll sheet. Be sure and sign this. I'll start it at the back so it gets all the way to the front by the time the class is over. I can just pick it up. We talked about whether or not marketing was an art or a science, and we really sort of determined most of you decided that it was both an art and a science. And we talked about this idea that marketing and art and science are in many respects in this modern era kind of collapsing because things that we used to think of as being wholly within the field of art, aesthetics, are now becoming more and more, it appears that they're objective. And this has broad implications, this idea that there is this melding of art and science for marketing in terms of designing things. One of the things that we know about in terms of designing ads, in terms of designing uh, product labels and product uh, packaging is that this element of design that we used to think was purely an art actually has some scientific uh, stuff to it. But there's things that we look for in terms of design and proportionality in, in terms of being able to really appeal to people in a very scientific way. Things that we used to think of were purely being a, an art are now becoming more and more scientific. In the 1960s, we get the third era of marketing. And this is, again, talked about in your textbook. For those of you who have this version of the textbook, the eras of marketing are talked about um, on page 15. If you have the 11th edition, we talked about the production era then the sales era, and really we see the scientific era of marketing coming into being in the 1960s. It's a recognition on the part of academics and companies that we can study the consumer in a really scientific way. We can go about really figuring out through things like psychology what it is that consumers want. So in many respects, marketing is the merging of two prior academic disciplines from an academic perspective, both of which I will make merciless fun of throughout the semester. Marketing is the marriage of psychology, which is the closest thing to witchcraft that we teach on a college campus. Now, lay on the couch and tell me how you feel about it. Turns out that with fMRI technology, we're figuring out that people say things that aren't necessarily so to their psychologists that are revealed by certain parts of the brain that are triggering when we study them under fMRI, functional magnetic uh, imaging technology, um, and the, the marriage of economics. So we have psychology and economics, and actually it really starts in the economics area with agricultural economics, and we'll talk about that in just a minute when I talk about the changing definitions of marketing. So in the 1960s, we begin to recognize that we can study consumers in a scientific way and figure out what it is that they want. It's no longer good enough to just produce goods cheaply for what we think of as being a homogenous society. Now, if you think about this from a historical perspective, this really makes sense. Up until about the 1960s, and by the way, from an academic perspective, in terms of academics, businesses and colleges of business are largely dominated by American thought. And so you think of, uh, if you go over to the College of Liberal Arts, they look at places like Oxford and they say, oh, well, that's sort of the mother university for Anglo-American thought. Not so in business. In business colleges, the vast majority of the best business colleges originated. They're not Oxford. They're not over in Europe. They actually originated here in the United States. And with regard to marketing, they actually originated in agricultural and mechanical schools like OSU. The biggest names in marketing were things like Purdue, which is an agricultural and mechanical school at the University of Wisconsin, which uh, they focus on cheese production and things like that. And so it was this agricultural economics and how do we get products from market to the consumer, from, from the producer to the consumer in the most efficient way. So it was agricultural economics and psychology. So we start studying the consumer 
in this very uh, sort of scientific way, and it becomes more and more scientific. We recognize that in this marketing era, we can no longer just produce things quickly and cheaply. We're going to have to, to really start to differentiate products for not so much a homogenous population. And you can see examples of this. One of the things in the political marketplace that is interesting, we're going through an election, and four years ago, Ari Shapiro was assigned to the Mitt Romney campaign. And he said that he knew Mitt Romney was going to lose. This is a political marketing analogy. When he was in Iowa, and Mitt Romney leans over to him and he says, look at that, Ari. Look at that out there. That's the real America. And Ari Shapiro said, no, sir, it's not. Iowa is nothing like the rest of America. It's overwhelmingly a homogenous population. The rest of America is not homogenous. It's rural. The rest of America is largely urban. That's not the real America. Before the 1960s, companies just assumed that everybody was sort of alike. You could, you could build things in sort of three sizes, small, medium, and large, and that was good enough. After the 1960s, we recognized that people are really fundamentally different. You could buy all sorts of stuff in catalogs. You still can. But they were built largely for this idea that things were homogenous. For example, Sears and Roebuck used to sell homes. You could build your entire house out of the Sears and Roebuck catalog. The city of Guthrie, where I am from, and I used to be the vice mayor in the great city of Guthrie, Oklahoma. I was my vice mayor after my mother was vice mayor. It's where I was born and raised. Um, is the largest collection of historic Victorian homes in the nation. And a lot of these homes were actually ordered out of the Sears and Roebuck catalog, and they were called shotgun houses. And the reason that they were called shotgun houses was because they said you could stand on the front porch and shoot chickens in the backyard and not hit the house. And they built these houses this way because in the 1800s, when Oklahoma was founded, 1889 when we had the land run on April 22nd, what didn't they have in houses that we have today? Makes it so much more convenient and pleasant than our houses today. They didn't have air conditioning. And so they built these shotgun houses, Sears and Roebuck offered these houses, so that all the doors in the house lined up so that you could get cross ventilation. You could open all the doors and in the summertime, you could get good cross ventilation in the house. That's an example of how, you know, today, would you build a house where all the doors lined up and you could go from, no, why? We have air conditioning and people want more customization. We don't want houses built that way. It's not Levittstown. So one of the things that happens after World War II is there are all these people that come back and they're relatively homogenous and they all need a house. All these GIs come back from the war and they build this town called Levittstown. They built them all over. They started in New York, Levittstown. And there's a song called Little Boxes. And if you've watched the television show, how many of you watched the TV show Weeds? A couple of you like the TV show Weeds. The theme song at the beginning of the first couple of seasons is the Little Boxes. You know, there are boxes on the hillside and they're all made out of tic tac and they all look just the same. In the 1960s, we start to realize that we're not as homogenous as we think we are, and that we're going to have to really differentiate products. And so we go about studying the consumer in a scientific perspective. How many of you watch Mad Men? Do you like Mad Men? None of you like Mad Men? You see this in an episode of Mad Men where they get they bring in these women to try out different types of lipstick in a focus group, and they watch them through a two-way mirror, and that's really what we start to do in the 1960s. Now we've entered into an era that we call the relationship era, or the era of value co-creation. It's no longer just enough to study the consumer. We actually have to engage them and make them a part of the team. There's a recognition now that it is easier to maintain a customer than it is to go prospecting for customers. And so we recognize something called customer lifetime value. Customers have a lifetime value. And if we can maintain them, they're more profitable than it is if we just go and constantly prospect. And that's what we do in this era of value co-creation. We engage the consumer to maintain this long-term relationship with them that adds value to both sides of the transaction. 
There's a car dealer in Dallas who is exemplified by this idea of customer lifetime value, and he's written uh, a paper that he got published. His name is Sewell. You will see Sewell Cadillacs around the Oklahoma City area. And the reason is, is that the customer experience from buying a Cadillac from Sewell is so good that he says that the average customer for him, and this was written about 10 years ago, has a lifetime value of $475,000. Because they'll be repeat customers, because he offers such good customer service and value co-creation. He says if you think about it, though, in terms of the people that they refer, and people in who are Sewell customers, who are Sewell Cadillac buyers, actually engage in something that we call WOM. Word of mouth. They are what we call marketing mavens. They actually engage in word of mouth, positive word of mouth, and there's negative word of mouth. So there's PWOM and NWOM. They actually go out and tell people about Sewell Cadillacs. And he says, if you take into account the number of people that we get from referrals, that customer is actually worth $4 million, a satisfied customer. So it's this idea that we really have to engage. Now, I can give you an example that's less sophisticated in terms of the amount of money, but relevant to you. What's coming up at the end of October? It's my favorite holiday. Halloween. Halloween. I love Halloween. The reason I love Halloween is that it's my mother's birthday. And so my mother would go out all out every year. She made all of our costumes by hand, and we won. They hated us in elementary school. They would see the, the Luker kids coming, and they knew that it was all over but the crying in terms of the prize money. She would make these really elaborate costumes. When E.T. came out, she made us E.T. costumes that would look just like E.T. And then I was a shark one year. She made a great white shark costume and the great pumpkin from Charlie Brown. So I love Halloween. One of the things that I loved to get at Halloween was M&M's candy. How many of you like M&M's? And why do we like M&M's? They're good. They're good. They melt in your mouth, not in your hands. Actually, if you have hands like me, I have little hot, sweaty hands. They'll actually melt in your hand if you hold them long. But they are kind of resistant. So that was their, their slogan forever and ever was melting out like your hands. So M&M's, the entire time I grew up, were a product that came in about three package sizes, the standard being about an ounce, a brown cellophane package, and they came in five colors. Um, brown, orange, yellow, red, and blue. And that was all you got. You could get three sizes of M&M's, sort of a big bag, a small bag, um, and a media bag and these little brown cellophane packages. That's no longer what M&M's is today. Now, you can customize your M&M's. You can get all kinds of different things. So you can start by designing your own M&M's. You can select all kinds of different colors. It's no longer just five colors. They've got pastel colors. They've got different shades of green, red, <coughs> yellow. So you can choose all of these different types of colors. You can add an image. You can put your creepy <laughs> wedding photo on your m and They really do kind of look creepy. You can add text to them. And then finally, you can select your own packages for m &Ms. This is mass customization. You can get it in a mini you know, gumball dispenser, jars, wedding cake tin, there's one with creepy images on it of people in a wedding photo. This is mass customization. So this is an era of value co-creation. Dell did this. Dell started out, how did you buy a Dell? You had to call, or you went online to order your Dell. And you would decide what suite of software you wanted, what kind of processor you wanted, what kind of memory, you know, things like that that you were interested in and then they would ship it to you. Now Dell has, in some ways, stopped engaging, and they've gone back to sort of a homogenization, 
in part of their market because there's a recognition that some people don't really want to wait two weeks to get their down. They want it right now. They want to go down to the big box store. And so there is sort of what we call, when we get to the logistics uh, side, a re-integration um, um, of the marketing channels, which it had been sort of disintermediated as a result of this mass customization. But it's this recognition that it's no longer just enough to study the consumer. We actually have to form relationships and partnerships with the consumer. And that's become enormously important. In our sales class, we talk about this. And we talk about reversing that pyramid. I talked about that sales model, the ADA model that uh, is making your pitch, uh, qualifying your prospects, and then closing long and hard. We now, in this relationship, focus on building a rapport, asking questions, finding out what it is that our customers want. And we spend less time in closing than we did before. So it's a, a reversal of that pyramid, and we now have an inverted pyramid structure. So we talked about marketing as a science. So what is the first step of establishing a science? And we talked about this, and one of you came up with the answer. And I was highly impressed by that. I've graded those papers, by the way. And I sent comments back. So you should have those comments in your D2L folders um, from uh, last uh, Tuesday. What is it that we decide that we're going to do when we decide something scientific? Well, we're going to follow a method, but we're going to have to define the domain of marketing. So what is the domain of marketing? What makes it different as a science than biology? Well, you start by giving a definition. And because marketing is a new science, we've actually changed the definition of marketing. And I will tell you that there's something that I think that we should add to that definition. And the American Marketing Association is actually currently looking at changing the definition. And some colleagues of mine and I have started writing papers suggesting that there's something that needs to be added to this definition. So the first association, or professional association for marketing, was called the National Association of Marketing Teachers. And it's for, it was the forerunner and it morphed into what we now call the American Marketing Association, or the AMA. And in 1920, or 1935, they came up with this definition of marketing that you should know for, uh, for the exam. Um, I'll repeat it several times, and I'll put this PowerPoint up on the D2L site so that you can get it. You should know this one in the current definition, at least, for the first exam. And we're going to talk about what's wrong with this definition in terms of establishing this idea of the domain of marketing science. So that first definition, and it was, by the way, adopted by the AMA in 1948 when the AMA came into existence. And then they uh, readopted it in 1960, and it stood for 50 years. And they said that marketing is the performance of business activities that direct the flow of goods and services from producer to consumer. And apparently, when I downloaded this, it messed up my PowerPoint. I must have gone from one version of PowerPoint to another because so I'm looking at the spaces. I had that all as one block quote on my computer. So what's wrong with this definition? Let's look at it again. Marketing is the performance of business activities that direct the flow of goods and services from producer to consumer. Want to tell me what's wrong with that? could have business activities in there that would account for those intermediaries, I guess. What did I tell you when you walked into this class on the first day? Yes, sir. Uh, the relationship might not necessarily be between a producer and a consumer. Ah, that's exactly it. It doesn't take into account the fact that I told you all that you all engage in marketing constantly. You all market yourself, don't you? You market yourself to your friends. You want people to like it. So it may not be from a producer to a consumer. It could be individuals. How many of you have a posse that you hang out with? Some of you are socially inept. You're not raising your hands. You have no friends. Is that what you're telling me? 
You're shaking your head. More, more than one friend. Okay. How many of you, I, as a child growing up, I was one that always had like one friend. My brother was always one that had a posse. And we reversed roles. I sort of forced myself to become more social. When I decided I wanted to be a politician, I became vice mayor. You have to force yourself to actually talk to more than one person. So I have a whole group of friends now that I run around with. You want them to do what you want them to do, right? So what do you do? You market. Hey, let's go do X, Y, and Z. There's new river rapids. The artificial river run on the Oklahoma River downtown, in Bricktown. I walk around Oklahoma City now, and I'm absolutely amazed at the things that we've been able to accomplish through the MAPS projects here. It used to be when I was growing up as a kid in Oklahoma City, you wouldn't have gone anywhere downtown after 5 o'clock to save your life. I mean, it was, it was a dangerous place. It was full of vandals and ne'er-do-wells after 5 o'clock. There was nothing going on down there. There was no restaurants. You, you were taking your life in your own hand. Now you walk around downtown Oklahoma City, and they have all of this stuff. We have the... Uh, uh, we have the ropes course on the river. How many of you have done the ropes course? If you take sports marketing with Dr. Workray, you get to go down and do the ropes course. You get to go on the rowing and kayaking and stuff like that. And now we have this new river rapid. So I want my friends to go do that with me. I, I like doing stuff like that. So I market to them. It's not, I'm not producing anything, am I? But I'm still getting some kind of exchange. So this is just focusing on business activities and marketing is greater than that. It's not just done by businesses, it's also done by nonprofits. It's done by individuals. It's done by governmental entities. The United States government markets, don't they? How many of you have seen ads for Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines? They have billboards up, right? It's, they're, not a, they're not producing anything in the way that we think of producers producing something, but they're marketing. So this definition doesn't take account of that. In the mid-1980s, the AMA began to revise the definition of marketing. And what they came up with is marketing is the process of planning and executing the conception, pricing, promotion, and distribution of ideas. Now, I do like this definition because it starts to focus on this idea that we've got ideas, goods, and services to create exchanges that satisfy individual and organizational objectives. So this is a better definition. It, it recognizes that it's individuals, it's organizations, it's not just products, it's not just tangible things. One of the things that we'll talk about, and one of the things that's the biggest growing part of our economy is the services sector, which is not a tangible thing. It's what I did as a lawyer. You can't touch what I did. What was it that you hire a lawyer for? It's not the piece of paper that they file at the courthouse, it's what? It, it's the knowledge that's in their head. You don't care about the piece of paper. You care about what they did to produce that piece of paper that means something. That's an intangible. So I like this definition. It's better. Your text, they then revised it. Um, and this is the textbook definition. You can see it on page five. Marketing is the activity for creating, communicating, delivering, and exchanging offerings that benefit customers, organizations, and stakeholders society at large. I think this is a much better definition, but I would add to it that it should include this phrase at the beginning. Marketing is a pervasive social activity. You cannot escape it. We are by nature social creatures. Aristotle said that. Aristotle said man is by nature a social creature. And as long as we're social, we engage in marketing. You cannot, you, I guess you could go to a deserted island somewhere and you could be all by yourself and you wouldn't engage in any market. But the minute you get more than one person together, you're going to start engaging in this exchange. So the concept of exchange is really central to marketing. This idea that it is pervasive. So what do you have to have for marketing? Well, 
you could go to the deserted island, and if you're all alone and you stay out there by yourself, you don't have, you're not going to engage more. Although I guess you could say you're marketing to yourself, your own needs, because you're going to have wants and needs. You're going to have to go harvest berries and things like that. And that's kind of a marketing activity, logistics, supply, chain, stuff like that. So you're going to have to have more than one party. And a desire and an ability to be satisfied. So you and your friends, going back to the friends example. What is it that you want your friends for? Friendship? Fun times. Fun times. <laughs> what Aristotle calls the, there are three types of friendship according to Aristotle. There's friendship grounded on utility, friendship grounded on pleasure. So you want the pleasure of their company. Somebody to do something with. So you have a desire and an ability to be satisfied. What do you want? Entertainment, for example. You've got to be able to communicate. And this is not as straightforward as it seems when we talk about integrated marketing communication, we'll talk about the challenges of communication. So you have to be able to communicate, and then you have to have something to exchange. What is it that you're exchanging between your friends. Excitement, good feelings, experiences, their company. Probably their gossip. Their gossip. <laughs> if you have nothing to say, if you have nothing nice to say, come sit by me. <laughs> I want to hear all about it. Something to exchange. So gossip, good times, fun feelings. So it can be intangibles, but you have to have something to exchange. That's what you're going to have to have for marketing to occur. So we need to talk about strategy. And I have a critical thinking exercise that we'll start with. I'll give you time in class to work on so that you'll have an opportunity to do this. Marketing strategies. And your text really talks about these ideas from a corporate level. And one of the things that I want to do, because I've emphasized this over and over, beginning of class, that marketing really is not just about the corporation, it's also about you, is how do you use marketing so that you're successful? So let's talk about strategies, not just at the corporate level, you have to know that for the exam, but let's talk about goals. What are goals? What is a goal? A short or long term objective. Okay, it's an objective. It's something that you what? You want to accomplish. That's what a goal is, right? Now, there are good goals and there are bad goals. What's a good goal? Now, when we talk about this and when we talk about the ethics part of this, we also have to think about things, and I'll, re I'll repeat this because redundancy is good. We have to think about there's high-level rationality and then there's low-level rationality. And when we talk about what's a good goal versus a bad goal, all I'm focusing on now is low-level rationality. What constitutes a goal that is a good goal, not necessarily a priori, but one that, you know, is something that can be ob obtained. Not, we're not talking about a priori good, we're talking about functionally good. Is it achievable? Okay, is it achievable? So, what makes the goal good? Let's see. What is a good goal? It's specific. So give me a goal. Who has a goal in here? You want to finish this semester. Is that really a good goal? Okay, you want, to, you want to finish this semester with A's. Why is that a better goal than just finishing the semester? Because the semester is going to come to an end regardless of your grade. Yeah, I mean, the semester is going to end whether or not, yeah, I mean, it, there's a, the nice thing, and one of the things that I like about teaching, and one of the reasons that I really enjoy my job more than I enjoy being an attorney, is that there never really seemed to be an end. When I had criminals, when I practiced criminal law, you know, I could get them out of one scrape, and the next thing you know, they're, they're right back um, you know, into something else. 
you, you get them out of the DUI case, and the next thing you know, it's armed robbery. <laughs> don't come in. Don't come knocking on my door. Then when I was a corporate attorney, it just sort of went on. The nice thing about teaching from a psychological standpoint is that there is a beginning. You know it's going to start here. You know there's going to be this middle where it's going to be really intense. And it's going to, you know, I'm going to have to grade and it's going to be awful. Or when I was a student, you're going to be totally stressed out at midterms. And then there's going to be this end. And there's like this weight that's lifted. But it's going to end on this day because grades have to be turned in on the state service. So you say you want to graduate, you want to, to uh, have all A's. You want to complete the semester with all A's. That's a pretty good goal. So that's pretty specific. It's objective. Can you determine it? That's the second thing. Can you measure it? Yeah. It's got to be measurable. How are you going to measure this? You get to the end of the semester, and you can what? You can look and see if you got all A's. And if you didn't, you can do what? Correct. <laughs> you can correct. You can modify your goals. My brother wanted to get a tennis scholarship in high school. And so he worked really, really hard playing tennis. He was ranked number 12 in the Missouri Valley at one time. You have to play so many tournaments to do this. And I'll never forget this friend of a friend, um, kind of hippie guy, was asking my brother about how he was doing. He's like, well, I'm, you know, I'm pretty good. I'm number 12. And this guy said, well, you know, that's great. But if you can't, you know, reach your goals, just lower your expectations. Mm -hmm. Don't ever give my brother advice again. <laughs> he was the only American on the OSU tennis team at the time. So, you know, he achieved his goals. It's measurable, specific. And then the third thing that makes a good goal is it should be realistic. Now, this doesn't mean that you as individuals shouldn't have stretch goals. So you say, I want to have all A's at the end of the semester. You get to the end of the semester, you have three A's and a B. Well, you can say, well, next semester I can do what? I can really, you know, focus more on this, or I can reduce my class schedule, or I can reduce the number of hours I'm working in order to achieve that goal. So it's not that it should be hard. Goals maybe should be hard, but they should be realistic. What would be an unrealistic goal? You could have a goal that was specific and measurable and completely unrealistic. I'm going to graduate with a bachelor's degree in one year. <laughs> Physically impossible to do, right? Is it specific? Uh, you could be even more, I'm going to graduate with a Bachelor's of Business Administration and Marketing from the University of Central Oklahoma in one year. With a 3.75. Yeah, I, yeah, with a 3.75. That's highly specific, it's objective. You can determine whether or not you achieve the goal. It is measurable, but is it realistic? How many hours do you have to have to graduate with a Bachelor's of Business Administration? 124, can you, can you possibly get in, you know, 124 hours, and even if you took, you know, 18 hours a semester and went in the summer, could you do it? No, that's still well short, so it should be realistic. So goals should be uh, specific and objective, measurable, and realistic. So. With that in mind, I have a critical thinking exercise for you, and I'm going to give you the rest of the hour to do this, because this one is kind of hard. It involves math. So I will pass this out. I've also posted it on D2L for you, because a lot of times students tell me in this class, I have a goal. i got to get this grade. I just have got to get a C in your class. How do, I, how do I do that? And then at the end of the semester, they're asking me if I can calculate their grade. And with 75 of you and one of me, it's kind of hard when I'm trying to grade other papers and midterm, or, uh, midterm uh, projects for my marketing ethics and my sales class to figure out everybody's grade at the last minute, figure out what you have, if you need you know, a certain thing. So I'm giving you this exercise. And it is a critical thinking exercise, so it's not just figuring 
the gray, but it's also being able to go beyond these numbers. And that's one of the things that we have to do in marketing. We use a lot of marketing numbers and metrics, sales forecasts, quotas, things like that. But it's also figuring out what the numbers mean. So a lot of times we use particularly accounting numbers in marketing to determine how we're doing. And it's being able to interpret those numbers that the accounting department gives us and figure out what they mean to us as marketers. Because what they mean to accountants may be different than what they mean to marketers. And I can give you an example. When I was in the corporate world, we had this product, a company that I worked for called Learning Letter Sounds, and it didn't make a profit. And the accounting department kept trying to get us to eliminate the product line, and we would say no. It's more valuable than what you think the numbers represent just on the, the piece of paper. Because what the product did was it was our cheapest product, but it got us into schools. We used it as our loss leader, and the accountants never understood this. That yes, it didn't make a profit, but we got into schools, and once the schools had it, they were hooked, and they would buy other products from us because it was a really good product and it demonstrated what we were able to do in terms of scores. We used it for reading scores and improving students' reading scores, which is one of the big things that was a big area of interest under the No Child Left Behind. So it's taking these numbers and understanding what they mean. Now every year that I've done this, somebody, they come up with the right, well, some of you will come up with the wrong numbers, which is not going to result in very good. And I've given you the, how the grades will be broken out in terms of the points here, a bunch of you will get the numbers all wrong. And if you do, you can't get full credit. And then some of you will just give me the numbers. And then some of you will give me these sort of, this is again a critical thinking exercise, some vapid interpretation of the numbers and what they mean. With regard to at least one of the students, you should have a recommendation about past performance. That you know, I mean, what you want is, in terms of setting your goals for this class, this is to help you figure out what it is that you need in terms of the value that you want to get, how to achieve that goal. So we're going to exchange, and here we've just talked about all this idea of exchange, we're going to exchange something in here. I'm giving you knowledge, you're going to give me work product, and then I'm going to give you something else in exchange, which is a what? A grade at the end of the semester. And you all would probably like it if I gave everybody A's, but that would lead to my being fired rapidly if I did that, because it would be called what? Great inflation. And then your degrees would be worth nothing. But I want you to be able to figure out how it is that you get what you want out of this course. Not everybody wants an A in this course. Some people just want, you know, if you're an accounting person and you really want to sit in the back room, uh, you know, with, with a set of books and do double entry bookkeeping, I understand that. Maybe you just want a C. My wife, my now ex-wife, you know, used to say C's get degrees. They do. So maybe all you want is all you want is a C. She she got through her college career with a you know a, a, just a C average. A two, what is the minimum that you have to have? Like a two point seven five or something, you know, to, to graduate. So. Um, Figure out what it is that you want. This will help you do that. Come up with um, uh, specific recommendations that are, you know, what you need for uh, the value. So I've given you the scores. You need to figure out how to calculate this. You need to show your work because it's entirely possible that you come up with now in the past, there are people that have gotten close to the number and I've been able to look at their work and figure out that the reason they didn't get the number that I got was because of a rounding error that they committed. Um, I go out two decimal points. Um, there, is some amb there is at least one ambiguity that you could find. If you really want full credit for this, there is at least one ambiguity that you could find in the syllabus that you should know. So I'm trying to give you suggestions. There's something you should recommend in Petra's past performance. And there's at least one ambiguity that you could find in the syllabus. Any questions? So work in your groups, yes ma'am. Um, how do you go about complementing? Like factoring each 
you can figure out what the ambiguity is. If, if you get the right number on one of the problems, and then you look at the syllabus, you can figure out what the ambiguity is. Are we saying this in FBA development? No, you're going to turn it in on Tuesday. It's due by Tuesday. And when do you pay for it? No, it'll, if there is a Dropbox that has been set up. Remember I told you there would be Dropboxes? Yeah, submit it to the Dropbox. Let's see, let me make sure I get out the Dropbox. Oh, I didn't. There will be a Dropbox. I just, I've got to the Dropbox. So I'll do that right now. Will it be per group or per individual? It's per group. And we'll have one Dropbox. Well, I read the